One of the central figures in the drama of the collapse of the Roman Republic and the rise of the Roman Empire was Mark Antony. He was a rather odd figure in Roman history. He came from a notable yet plebeian family. Neither was he a great general. Yet he was at the right place at the right time, and his actions played a huge part in the Republic's collapse. Learn more about Marcus Antonius, a.k.a. Mark Antony, and how he found himself at the center of Roman history on this episode of Everything Everywhere Daily. This episode is sponsored by ButcherBox. You've probably heard the old adage that you are what you eat. Nowhere is this more true than with the meats and seafoods you consume. And that is why ButcherBox sources only the highest quality meats and seafood. All of their beef is grass-fed and grass-finished. All of their chicken is pasture-raised. And all of their seafood is wild-caught. They're able to do this by finding only the best producers who can meet their high-quality standards. Make a commitment to eat better this year with the best meat and seafood on the planet delivered directly to your door. ButcherBox is currently offering my listeners their choice of a weeknight meal essential. Three pounds of chicken thighs, two pounds of ground beef, or one pound of premium steak tips. For free in every order for a whole year. Plus, you get $20 off your first order. So sign up today at butcherbox.com slash daily and use code daily to choose your free offer and get $20 off. This episode is sponsored by BetterHelp. We're now well into 2024, and it's the time of year when people make resolutions to change their lives. However, most of us don't need to overhaul our lives completely. Most of us simply need to recognize and focus on our strengths. It isn't necessary to make extreme resolutions, you just need someone to help you recognize what you're doing right so you can work on what needs improvement. BetterHelp is all about making professional counseling accessible, convenient, and affordable. With BetterHelp, you can connect with a licensed therapist from the comfort of your own home via online video sessions, chat, or phone calls. No matter where you are or what you're going through, BetterHelp is there for you. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist, and you can switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. Start the new year by identifying your strengths so you can work on the rest with BetterHelp. Celebrate the help you've already made. Visit BetterHelp.com everywhere today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash everywhere. The man that history knows as Marcus Antonius is better known in the English-speaking world as Mark Antony. Not to be confused with the Latin Grammy-winning musical artist and former husband of Jennifer Lopez, Mark Anthony. The reason we call Marcus Antonius Mark Antony is totally due to William Shakespeare, who refers to him as such in his play Julius Caesar. Because he's so much better known by his Shakespeare moniker, for the rest of this episode I'll simply refer to him as Mark Antony, or just Antony. Mark Antony was born into a noteworthy family in the gens Antonia on January 14, 83 BC. A Roman gens was sort of an extended family who all claimed the same ancestry and had the same nomen, and I'll refer you back to my episode on Roman naming conventions. There were both patrician and plebeian wings of the Antonia gens, and Mark Antony came from the plebeian wing of the family. His father was Marcus Antonius Creticus, who was, by all accounts, an incompetent general who was given the task of clearing the Mediterranean of pirates. He once attacked the island of Crete, which had formed an alliance with the pirates, and was defeated. His cognomen, Creticus, means conqueror of Crete, and was given to him sarcastically. His grandfather was a gifted order named Marcus Antonius, who was killed by Marius during the First Roman Civil War. His mother was a woman named Julia, who was Julius Caesar's distant third cousin. Mark Antony's father died in Crete when he was only nine years old. His mother remarried a man by the name of Publius Cornelius Lentulus Sura, who was later executed on the order of Cicero due to his involvement in the Catiline Conspiracy, on which I've also done a previous episode. Mark Antony spent his adolescence with little parental supervision and got into a lot of trouble. He was associated with a street gang in Rome, led by the Roman politician Publius Clodius Pulcher, and he also happened to accrue a significant amount of gambling debt. In 58 BC, he fled to Athens, where he studied philosophy, but was really there just to avoid his debtors. 
In 57 BC, he joined the army under the command of Aulus Gabinius, the proconsul of Syria, and was given command of his cavalry. Here he found great success on and off the battlefield. He assisted Gabinius in restoring Ptolemy XII to the throne of Egypt as a client king of Rome. And while he was in Egypt, he briefly met the 14-year-old daughter of Ptolemy XII, Cleopatra. While he was in Egypt, Rome came under the control of the First Triumvirate, which consisted of Julius Caesar, Pompey Magnus, and Marcus Licinius Crassus. One of the men they used to bring order to the streets of Rome was none other than Publius Clodius Pulcher, in whose gang Mark Antony once belonged. It was through him that Antony managed to secure a position on the staff of Julius Caesar in 54 BC, right in the middle of Caesar's conquest of Gaul. Under Caesar, Antony proved himself to be an exemplary military leader. He was well-liked by his men and developed a friendship with Caesar that would last his entire life. In 52 BC, Caesar sent him to Rome so he could begin his political career. He was elected to the position of quaestor, and his assignment was to serve Caesar, so he went back to Gaul. And there he fought with Caesar at the Battle of Elysia. And again, I've previously done an episode on the Battle of Elysia, one of the most improbable and incredible battles in all of history. After Antony's year as quaestor was over, Caesar appointed him legate, a position equivalent to a high-ranking general, which gave him command of two full legions. While serving under Caesar, the situation in Rome began to fall apart. Crassus, one of the triumvirs, had been killed in battle, and Pompey's wife and Caesar's daughter, Julia, died in childbirth. Pompey was elected the sole consul in 52 BC. Eventually, as relations between Caesar and Pompey worsened, Antony was sent back home to Rome in 49 BC. There he was elected tribune of the plebs, from where he could veto any legislation and protect Caesar. In that year, things fell apart even further. And while Antony tried to negotiate a compromise on Caesar's behalf, the Senate refused to budge, eventually causing Antony to flee to Caesar's army on the banks of the Rubicon River, the traditional boundary of Italy. Caesar marched into Rome unchallenged, and then leaves Rome to take on the forces of Pompey in the Senate, leaving Antony back home with the title of proprietor and the governor of Italy. Antony was, by any account, a pretty awful administrator but he did represent Caesar's interests while he was away. Caesar took care of business in Spain and then went to Greece where Pompey and the Senate's forces had gathered. However, Caesar didn't have enough ships, so he only took two legions with him to Greece and left his other five legions with Antony in Italy. Antony managed to get the other legions across the Adriatic Sea to Greece by tricking the commander of Pompey's fleet. In Greece with Caesar, he was clearly cemented as Caesar's number two man and served with distinction there, including leading troops on the battlefield at the decisive Battle of Pharsalus in August of 48 BC, where Caesar defeated Pompey. After the battle, Caesar returned to Rome briefly, got named dictator, and appointed Antony as his master of horse, which is basically like being vice dictator. Caesar then left Rome in 47 BC to go to Egypt to pursue Pompey, and left Antony in Rome to take care of matters there. While in Egypt, Caesar placed Cleopatra on the throne, had an affair with her, and they had a child together by the name of Caesarion. Once again, Antony proved himself to be a poor and unpopular administrator, and this led to a rift with Caesar, and when Caesar came back to Rome, he stripped Antony of all official titles. Despite the rift between the two men and the several years Antony spent on the sidelines, Antony remained loyal, which paid off in the year 44 BC when he was named consul alongside Caesar, who also happened to have been appointed dictator for a 10-year term. This 10-year dictatorship was eventually upgraded to dictator for life when their terms began as consul. During the festival of Lupercalia in February of that year, Antony offered Caesar a crown during one public display, which Caesar famously turned down, indicating that he refused to be a king. However, others saw it differently, and on March 15, 44 BC, Caesar was assassinated on the floor of the Senate. The assassination of Caesar ended one chapter in the life of Mark Antony, and it began another. With Caesar dead, and him being the only sitting consul, Mark Antony found himself in a leadership position without being subordinate to Caesar. Antony found himself the leader of the Caesarian forces and managed to negotiate an agreement with the Senate faction that had killed Caesar. With an army outside the city, he negotiated terms very favorable to himself. 
When Caesar's will was read, it was discovered that his heir and posthumously adopted son was his great-nephew, Octavian. Part of the agreement with the Senate that Antony had negotiated was that Caesar would get a public funeral, which Antony would preside over. He gave a fiery eulogy which set the crowd to riot and attack the homes of the conspirators, causing many of them to flee Rome. Shakespeare captured this event in the famous speech that begins, Friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ear. Antony and Octavian soon found themselves in conflict as to who was going to head the Caesarian faction, and Antony's forces were actually pushed back out of Italy. However, it soon became obvious that as Antony and Octavian were fighting with each other, the forces of the Senate were waiting for the two to weaken each other so they could attack the survivor. Antony and Octavian put aside their differences and joined forces, creating what was known as the Second Triumvirate, along with one of Caesar's generals, Marcus Aemilius Lepidus. Antony and Octavian sealed this pact by Antony marrying Octavian's sister, Octavia. The three divided up the administration of Rome between them. Lepidus got North Africa, Octavian got Italy and the western provinces, and Antony got the wealthy eastern provinces. It was during this period of consolidating power that the triumvirate issued a proscription list, confiscating the property of anyone on the list who could be then legally murdered. And this was when Antony got his revenge on Cicero, who had killed his stepfather. The triumvirate forces were eventually victorious over the Senate at the Battle of Philippi in 42 BC. With the assassins defeated, Lepidus was soon pushed aside, leaving Rome divided between Octavian in Rome and Antony in Alexandria, where he had begun an affair with Cleopatra. Antony and Cleopatra had three children together, and they married in an Egyptian ceremony without Antony first divorcing Octavia. Relations between Octavian and Antony worsened, and each knew that there would eventually be a war, but neither wanted to be the one to strike first. Each knew that no one wanted another civil war, and so didn't want to be seen as the aggressor. When Roman lands were split between them, Antony thought that he got the better deal because Octavian was stuck dealing with all the domestic problems of Rome. However, it also gave Octavian the opportunity to issue propaganda against Antony without any rebuttal. Antony was painted as someone who had gone native, adopting Egyptian customs and abandoning Rome. Much of this was spun in such a way as to make it seem like it was Cleopatra's fault and Antony was just a victim. What caused a final break with Rome and a turn in public attitudes towards Antony was a proclamation made by Antony and Cleopatra in 34 BC, known as the Donations of Alexandria. In it, Antony gave several Roman provinces to his and Cleopatra's children. Eventually, this became too much even for Antony's supporters, several of which whom defected to Octavian's side. They told him about Antony's will, which had been filed at the Temple of Vesta in Rome. In 32 BC, Octavian managed to get a hold of the will and read it publicly. In it, Antony confirmed giving away Roman provinces and expressed a desire to be buried in Egypt, not Rome. This outraged Romans such that the Senate stripped Antony of all official positions and declared war on Cleopatra. Octavian didn't want this to be seen as another civil war. In 31 BC, Octavian's forces met the forces of Antony in Egypt at the Battle of Actium, a naval battle that took place off the coast of Greece. The battle was decisively won by Octavian, causing Antony to flee back to Egypt, with most of his remaining Roman forces deserting him. Antony and Cleopatra made it back to Alexandria, where Octavian's forces pursued them. Knowing that the end was near, with the people and the army of Rome having turned against him, he took his own life in 30 BC by falling on his sword. The rise and fall of Mark Antony is an unusual tale in history. During his life, he showed displays of brilliance, like when he manipulated the Senate after the assassination of Caesar. He managed to maneuver them into giving him exactly what he wanted so he could cause them to flee the city. He showed moments of brilliance on the battlefield, having commanded legions under Caesar during some of his greatest battles. But at the same time, he was also an inept administrator, and in the end alienated his own troops and the Roman public. In the centuries that have passed since his death, Caesar, Octavian slash Augustus, and Cleopatra have all been the subject of plays and movies. Mark Antony has a supporting role in all of their stories, yet there are seldom any stories where he is the central character. 
Much of the reason we know him today is because he was at the right place at the right time. He joined Caesar's army at its peak and managed to work his way into a position of trust and authority just when Caesar increased his power over all of Rome. Historians have painted Antony as someone who ruled by his emotions and passions, who ultimately was outmaneuvered by his rival and former partner Octavian. Antony's role in the rise of Julius Caesar, and as one of the principal characters after his assassination, gives him a central role in the death of the Roman Republic. The executive producer of Everything Everywhere Daily is Charles Daniel. The associate producers are Peter Bennett and Cameron Kiefer. Today's review comes from listener BigFed2 over on Apple Podcasts in the United States. They write, So informative. I love this podcast. I came across it about two weeks ago, and now I can't get enough. I learn something new every day. Keep up the good work. Well, thanks, Big Fed 2. I'm glad you found the show, and I'm glad you enjoy it. And if you go back and listen to all the previous episodes, one day you might be able to claim a spot in the coveted Completionist Club. Remember, if you leave me a review or send a boostagram, you too can have it read on the show. Friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ears. I come to bury Caesar, not to praise him. The evil that men do lives after them. The good is oft interred with their bones. So let it be with Caesar. The noble Brutus hath told you Caesar was ambitious. If it were so, it was a grievous fault, and grievously hath Caesar answered it. Here, under leave of Brutus and the rest, for Brutus is an honourable man, so are they all, all honourable men, come I to speak in Caesar's funeral. He was my friend.